This video is brought to you by Xavi's new Star Trek merch line. In my video for the previous short tracks, I said it was a show with a lot of potential for some very cool stuff, and season 2 pretty much did what I wanted it to, and might have become one of my favourite elements of modern Star Trek. There's a great willingness for experimentation and bold storytelling, which is really refreshing in a franchise as old as this one. In the first outing for Volume 2, we have Q&A, a glimpse back to Spock's first day on the Enterprise as a young ensign. I was already itching for a Pike-led spin-off show, and these further glimpses at the pre-Kirk Enterprise has turned that into a total craving. Ethan Peck continues to prove himself as an inspired casting. Much like Zachary Quinto in the Kelvin Timeline films, there's a clear respect for the great work of Leonard Nimoy, but at the same time Peck has made the role his own. And much like season 2 of Discovery, it's great to see a younger Spock when he was much more willing to express his emotions, as we originally saw in The Cage. But while Anson Mount's Captain Pike was the performance everyone was talking about last year, this time it's Rebecca Romaine who shines with her new interpretation of Number One. Number One is a character we only caught glimpses of in Discovery Season 2, so it's great to see her get a spotlight here. There's an eerily perfect balance of steadfast devotion to duty and protocol, as well as a command-appropriate gravitas. But at the same time, we get a good grasp of of number one on an emotional level. Seeing her geek out over techie details with Spock, share in a sense of awe for the wonders of space travel, and find out what makes her tick when it comes to command philosophy. On top of this fantastic character introspection, the setup of being stuck in a turbo lift offers a lot of charm and humour. There is a fun quirkiness to the interaction, which makes getting to know these characters all the more enjoyable. Ending on a beauty shot of the gorgeously updated Enterprise Bridge, and this was a strong opening for a new set of stories. The trouble with Edward brings with it all the fun a triple-focused episode usually does. Rosa Salazar is one of those people who should be in way more stuff, and I hope she lands something big in a large franchise someday. If you haven't seen Alita Battle Angel, check it out to get a good sense of her relatively untapped star power. By following her, we get a nice glimpse on a purpose-built pure science vessel. Without the fallback of a healthy armament, I'd actually be really keen to see more stories set on these kinds of ships. But just as Salazar is owning the episode with her perfectly tailored Starfleet Commander Optimism, along comes H. John Benjamin to steal the scene from everyone. Just as Benjamin's immediately recognisable voice lends him a distinct screen presence, and his deranged and almost sociopathic tendencies make for a pretty captivating character to conflict with Captain Lucero's idealism. And the comedic chemistry between them both in the this conversation is over scene had me wanting for heaps more. I know this is just a short trek, but come on, these two could easily carry their own show. I'd even settle for a miniseries. My one gripe with the episode is that it's a bit heavy with the triple fan service, and the origin story is a bit disappointing. Back when people were theorising Discovery was going to do a Borg origin story, I said on my Twitter I'd be a bit let down if that was the case. Tying the origin of iconic things into long-running franchises back to a close-to-home source only serves to minimise the scale of that universe. The Tribble's trademark superbreeding and vehement hatred from the Klingons, all being the fault of a single Starfleet officer, is a bit contrived. It only serves to have his fans go, Oh, I know where this is going, but that fleeting feeling doesn't really make a good story. That being said, this was a fun wee romp with enjoyable characters and performances, and honestly, you can't really go wrong with Tribbles. Ask Not came along again to make me yearn for that Pike spin-off show. It was a fun little thought experiment, but ultimately, you can kind of see the twist coming from pretty far away. Being so familiar with the Captain Pike character at this point, it's pretty clear he isn't acting like himself as he tries to negotiate his way out of handcuffs. The whole time I was thinking, right, this is either all a training up or it's a robot copy of Pike or something. But despite the predictable plotting, this is a nice, compact two-hander of a story. Mount is just as terrific acting out of character as he is acting in character, and Armit Kerr as Cadet Sido also did a great job. She was able to match wits with Pike as a character and screen presence with Mount as an actress. I just think it's a shame we'll likely never see this character again. The compact two-hander of Q&A gave us a nice insight into characters we're already familiar with, and are able to explore more in other stories, but unfortunately the same can't be said for Cadet Sido. Overall, an enjoyable little story, if ultimately inconsequential. Into some animated stories now. But first, a word from this video's sponsor. This video was brought to you by a new Star Trek merch line launching on the 29th at Zavi.com. A slew of brand new, very cool designs to satiate your Star Trek itch. I myself really like this Section 31-esque jumper, which I was kindly gifted with. It's got a really nice embroidered design, one of many really cool designs in this range, and is pretty cosy for these winter months. Click the link below on the 29th and use the promo code BATTLE20 for 20% off the Star Trek range or the code BATTLE10 for 10% off the site-wide items. Thank you once again to Zavi for sponsoring this video, and now back to some more short tracks. 
I've always been interested in the idea of animated Star Trek content, ever since the rough quality of the original animated series was still able to open up the scale of what was possible in the Star Trek universe. The first animated story, F. Raymond Dot, directed by one of my favourite Star Trek composers, was a fun wee romp. Doing what is essentially a Looney Tunes slash Tom and Jerry race around greatest hits reel of TOS era is not really what I expected, but that's not a bad thing. The animation style is really nice, settling into that halfway point between hand-drawn and 3D animation. The title characters have nicely distinctive designs and communicate a lot of expression through their movements and expressions. The short is full of energy and flies by so fast it's almost like being on a theme park ride, and all the while being carried by new renditions of classic TOS score tracks was treat to the ears. I don't really have much else to say about this one, I thought it was fun, charming, it looked great and sounded great, it was a unique track story and a fun way to spend 8 minutes. The Girl Who Made the Stars was something quite special though, and one I really enjoyed. Once again the animation itself is really really nice to look at. The framing device of a bedtime story for an incredibly cute baby Burnham sets us up for a really fresh piece of storytelling. From the same director of last year's Calypso, still the best of the short treks so far in my opinion, this is an exquisitely told tale. One of the great things about diverse voices behind the camera is how the resulting stories can be so fresh and new to audiences who aren't as familiar with other cultural voices. The typical bedtime story setup has us ready to expect a traditional fairy tale-like story, but instead the girl who made the stars spins as a yarn heavily inspired by African folklore. A story about conquering fears of the unknown in order to discover a wider and wondrous universe is quintessentially Star Trek, yet with virtually no Star Trek references outside of the framing device. It's a powerful and encouraging short story and has me excited for what else can be done with Star Trek animation in the future. The final short trek of the season is Children of Mars. Once again, this is a great opportunity to show us a side of the Star Trek universe we rarely get a good look at. We spend so much time on the frontiers of space with Starfleet crews, it's a welcome change to see the more civilian, everyday life side. It's a simple tale of a clash between two girls almost entirely without dialogue, and yet it's perfectly understandable. The disappointment of an always at work father expressing itself as anger toward the closest person and the escalation of each retaliation, and in my book, putting any Peter Gabriel song in your show or movie gets a thumbs up from me. However, it's the ending which really raised my eyebrows, so to speak. The sudden devastating attack on Mars which likely kills the parents of both girls really hits hard, and to see them set aside their differences to make sure each other aren't alone is really touching. Once again a typically humanist Star Trek story, but it's the unexpected tie into the upcoming Star Trek Picard video coming at the end of this month, which made me most curious. There is a blink and you'll miss it shot of a headline showing the culprit of these attacks, not to be Romulans as many would expect, but rogue synths. I have so many questions about who these synths are. Are these positronic androids? Liberated Borg drones? A new race of artificial beings? What? I want to know! So Children of Mars exceeds both as a heartwarming personal story and as some marketing for their next major installment of the Star Trek franchise. I can't wait for that and I can't wait for more short tracks. The potential in jumping around timelines, characters, exploring new formats and narrative styles makes me super excited to see what else can be done with short tracks. Some are stronger than others, but overall it absolutely did not suck. Rob Kemp asks, Do you think Starfleet could use a force like the Makos from Enterprise? It was actually an intention of Gene Roddenberry's to have a Starfleet Marine Corps feature in the original series at some point. The Makos were an expression of this idea, and to me it actually makes a lot of sense. I know the Federation has a general diplomacy first policy, but at the same time it's been in so many wars. Asking Starfleet crews to be explorers, scientists, diplomats and soldiers all at the same time is a big ask. I think a Starfleet Marine Corps would make a lot of sense as a kind of specialised organisation within Starfleet to be deployed on the front lines when negotiation has altogether failed. It's totally possible for the Federation and Starfleet to have a militant organisation without falling prey to narrow-minded jingoism or warmongering. If a threat like the Dominion ever showed up again, a lot of lives could be saved. Michael Lewis asks, What do you think of a Starship Troopers remake which sticks closer to the books? Um, mixed feelings about that idea. I really love the Paul Verhoeven movie, but I think it's great precisely because it's a satire. Verhoeven is on record saying he didn't like what the book had to say, and to be honest, Robert Heinlein's political beliefs is a huge can of worms I'm not going to get into right here, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't find some elements of the book a bit troubling. The movie adaptation is almost like a middle finger to some of the messages of the book. It has loads to say about dehumanisation, the aforementioned jingoism, civil liberties, propaganda, etc, which I think would be very relevant in today's world, but it only hit on that great material essentially out of spite for the book. So overall, I'd be keen on a new movie adaptation, 
but I'd prefer it to be in the spirit of the Verhoeven movie rather than anything which adheres closer to the book. Thanks for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date with all my new uploads. Over on my Patreon, you can see videos early for as little as $5 a month. Speaking of which, special thanks to all of my patrons who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.